Hello, everybody. Hi, I'm Julie, Faith Ann Balzer, and feel free to say hello in the chat. This is Book Club. So every month we talk about some kind of art-related book. Sometimes it's instructional, sometimes it's not. And did I say week when I meant month? I can't even remember. I was up with my two-year-old for most of the night, so my brain is sort of half in my head. I apologize. Um, but this is the book that we're talking about. It's Abstracts in Acrylic and Ink by Jody Ole. And so do let let me know if you have this book, if you like it, if you love it, if you hate it, if you've never ever seen it before and sort of, you know, what you're interested in. So I will say that I um, have met Jody in person a few times. We've run into each other at various uh, things over the years. And she was a guest on the Adventures in Arting podcast that I host in 2006. 16, I think, or maybe even 2015, so a while ago. She is very smart, very nice, very sweet, very talented, all the things that you would expect her to be. And so it's always nice to be able to talk about her work. I also think her work is beautiful. It's, you know, she she does a really good job with all the colors and lots of pattern and all that kind of stuff too. So I can see in the chat, I know that Sherry said before we even started that she enjoyed the book so much that she's going to buy it and try some of the exercises. Now, that is an interesting thing that I want to talk about, which is sometimes when you read a book versus when you do the exercises out of it, it's a very different experience. And I have found sometimes that I'm not that interested in a book and then I do the exercises and it blows my mind. And it also can go the other way for me where I think I love the book. I start to do the exercises and then I go, Ooh, I, I don't like this book at all. So it's I'm going to be very interested, Sherry, once you actually try out the exercises, kind of how you feel about it. I see that Janice says that she has it. It's really good. Eileen also really likes it. Craig says that it's a great pick for the book club. By the way, it was not my pick. I can't take any credit for it. Um, somebody suggested it. Um, we have someone from Spain, someone from Houston, Texas. It's so nice to see everybody here. Okay, so let's jump into it. Let me add my other camera into the stream here. And this is the book. You can see it's got lots of, I have to tell you, first of all, the photography in this book is outstanding. If you ever wanted to see sexy photos, I mean, like if you're looking for like art porn, <laughs> this is it. These are some seriously sexy photos of art supplies. I wish that someone could come and make my mess look this absolutely just gorgeous and stunning. So I just, I love the photography in this book. I think it's great. Um, and then Jody's work, there are lots of small photos, big photos, all that kind of stuff. She has the sort of required supply section up front where she talks about the different supplies that she uses. Um, and then we sort of jump into it. So this is the first exercise working um, fast and small. And for each of these exercises, the way the book is set up is there'll be her finished pieces. And then they take you through the exercise kind of step by step in these little steps. So I did this exercise about working fast and small. Um, and so here are my, I didn't do four, I did three little panels, okay? Um, and you can see they look very different from hers, enormously different from hers. And I think that that's another thing that's important to remember is that you're not, not trying to like imitate um, somebody, what they're doing, you're trying to like get the gist of the idea they're getting across. Now I wrote some notes for myself on a post-it as I went through the exercise. Um, for me, some of the, one of the issues I had with this is that I felt like the instructions were a little incomplete and I'll tell you why. So I think that Jody is enormously good at making you feel free and easy. Um, but I several times was like, oh, I can see because I have an educated eye that she picked highly contrasting colors, right? So that there would be a pop, but it doesn't say in here to pick highly contrasting colors. So I wanted to try the exercise picking not highly contrasting colors and just sort of, you know, like see how that went. Um, and it looks very different, you know, uh, partially because of that. So it's just an interesting thing. And there are a couple other little things like that. Um, I didn't, um, 
see a lot of mention here about some of the fine line work that she does. And sometimes there are instructions that kind of show something and skip over stuff that might be. So if you're a super beginner, I think that might be a little confusing. I think if you're an intermediate, then no problem. You'll have a great time with this book, you know, just chugging along and getting going through it. Okay. I did have one kind of big question that came up for me several times, which again, I wrote on a post-it here. Um, and that question was why these materials? And the reason I had that question is as follows. So she's talking, you know, often about the different materials that she's using. Um, and I often wonder why is she using a fine liner instead of a paintbrush or instead of a pen or instead of whatever, why is she using, you know, gesso board instead of canvas or instead of canvas board. And I think the reason I'm looking for the why of that is really based on the way that like my brain works and the way that I teach. And so here's what I mean by that. So this is kind of a philosophical thing for me, which is, it's really important to me like in the way that I teach all my classes is I always tell people the reason I'm doing this is X and that allows you to make a supply substitution, right? If you don't know the reason why I'm using that supply, you can't make a supply substitution. So you have to use the supply I'm using because you don't understand and you also don't understand why it works. So sometimes replicating the technique is really hard. So an example is if I'm using spray ink and I say this has to be a water soluble spray ink because we're going to go next in on the next layer, then you can use any brand of water soluble spray ink, or in fact, you could use any brand of water sol soluble media probably if the point of it is to get it to react right in the next layer. So a little bit throughout, she's very specific about supplies without any information about why. And I guess the curious student in me really wanted to know, because I think she's deeply knowledgeable and obviously passionate about all of this stuff. So I just wanted a little bit why, 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 why. Um, that said, one of the techniques she's showing here, um, and oh, I'm looking at the book, but I'm not showing it to you. Here you go. One of the techniques that she's showing here is drawing some shapes on a clear sheet of wet media Duralar and then putting it on top of your piece. Now, I actually love Duralar and use it all the time. In fact, I have a whole folder of painted Duralar that I've done over the years. Um, it's just in my stash, you know, of collage stuff. So some of it is really kind of like crazy. You can see that if you use opaque stuff, it looks different on one side than it does on the other, even though it's a clear sheet, right? But you can still see my fingers through here. But the thing that's cool about wet media Duralar is it is just what it says. Like you can actually watercolor on it. So here is a piece. This is not acrylic paint. This is watercolor in here and you can really like get it on here. Okay. And the, and here is some examples here or on Duralar, by the way, this is clear. It just has a clear, um, not a clear, a like white tissue paper on it. But here's somewhere that I've done with acrylic paint. And here is some that I, this is just a pen, right? And then the cool thing about this, of course, is that you can take your artwork and you can place this on top of it. Now, one of my issues and the reason that I find Duralar sometimes hard to use is because suddenly then on your piece, you can see what has happened here with her piece. Let me just get this out of. Let me just try to unmask this, but you can see sort of what happened with her piece, which is that you can really see the outline of the Duralar. You can really see that square because you suddenly, suddenly have this like big shiny square on it. So for me, that's kind of an issue. But at the end of her book, she gave a tip that's unrelated to this and it blew my mind in terms of thinking how to integrate the Duralar. So I'm going to share that at the end of the book when we get there, because I think you might be as excited as I am about it. OK, so um, moving on from here, there are lots and lots of exercises with tons of different kind of substrates. Yubo paper here using um, creating all kinds of bubbles with heat and stuff like that. Um, experimenting with different mediums. She really is pushing you to try different things, see what happens. And that is such a great philosophy. So um, here she talks about creating an acrylic skin. And this is actually something that I have done for several years. I think I saw first from Jane Davies and I actually taught it once on um, Make It Artsy. So what you do, 
So this is, by the way, this is my folder of skins. I believe in labels, a small organizational thing, I will just say, which is no matter how well you think you know your space and where everything is, it never hurts to labels. You don't need a fancy label machine. This is tape that I wrote on with a Sharpie and it works great. So I know where everything is. Okay. So um, here is an example of a skin and I just have a piece of, these can get sticky. So this is a piece of parchment paper that I just stapled on top here. So it doesn't stick to the next one that's in here. But this is exactly what it sounds like, which is this is a, you put down a clear medium, a clear gloss medium like tar gel. And apparently this is going to be stuck on here and drive me crazy. But you can theoretically, there we go, if you can get a hold of it, pull off. Well, partially pull off. There you go. I'll give it a good tug later. But you can see it's a clear skin of paint. So reading through this book and reading about the acrylic skins motivated me to grab my art journal and cut up some of my acrylic skins and throw them in. So I thought I would show you. Here is an example that I did of, maybe take the tab out. Here is a page where you can see this is the clear acrylic skin right here. Here's the outline of it. And if I can get it really close to the camera, you can see the shine on it and you can see how it's transparent, right? I'm seeing the yellow through it. I'm seeing the blue through it. And yet there's this pattern and all this kind of stuff on it. It looks really neat. And another example of that in this journal is right here, this one. If you follow me on Instagram, you might have seen that I did a um, video where I showed the process of putting this page together and I glued this clear skin right in during the video. And you can see it right there. It's kind of dimensional. I hope my camera is good enough for you to see sort of how thick this one is. They don't have to be this thick, but it is nice when they're somewhat substantial. Um, and then, you know, just adding a little bit of interesting texture to the mix. Okay. So that's kind of the clear skins, which is a great neat technique. And if you've never, ever tried it, you know, I would say give it a go. In terms of the process, I think you can see it pretty clearly here. You pour out the medium, you drop in your color, you let it dry. That's as simple as it is. That's all it is. Okay. Um, and the biggest, hardest part is, you know, waiting because you really have to wait a while. It has to dry for like overnight or something like that. So I hope that answers that question, Catherine. You can also find free videos. If you just type in um, creating an acrylic skin into the YouTube search bar, you will find tons and tons of videos of people showing you how to do it. Okay. So um, next up. So um, here you go. This was such an interesting page to me. And I'm going to tell you why it looks kind of boring compared to a lot of the other pages that might be more interesting. But one of my personal interests or the things that really like geeks me out is that I am deeply, deeply, deeply interested in just like flat out art nerdery. I think that would be the best way to put it. But like, if you give me vocabulary words, if you tell me, you know, just like basic building block techniques, I am 100% into it. So in this part of the book, just right here, this is a wash, which of course I think most of us are familiar with. You just add water to it. You know, you add water to your paint and basically what happens is it breaks down the pigment and you get this kind of splotchy spotty effect, right? Then this is a glaze where what you do is you add medium to your acrylic paint and, in, and it makes it more translucent, but it doesn't break the pigment down. And it's actually much better for your painting and for your work if you really use washes very sparingly because it can make the acrylic break down and actually fall off of your work later, which is not great, especially if you're selling it, right? Now, there were two terms I hadn't heard of, okay? Um, and I went looking on the internet to see if they were actual art terms or things that she made up. As far as I can tell, I think they're terms that she uses in her own art vocabulary, which is awesome. And I think we should all have our own art vocabularies that we use. So the first is a stain where you brush the paint on and then you rub it in with a cloth. Kind of the way I assume you would do wood stain, right? Which I think is where she's pulling the name. 
And, but I did look up paint stain, paint stain. And like, there are things that are paint stains, but there's nobody who is talking about that, oh, that you can use acrylic paint to stain, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then this one, she says, create a veil. So here it says, um, paint the surface, mix matte medium into your top coat to dilute the color. The result is a soft frosted hue when dry. So it took me a minute to realize that when she says, um, mix matte medium into your top coat, she means that you're using white paint. So it's basically what I might have called like whitewashing or something like that over the top. So I did my own little sample book because I love in my sketchbook having samples and examples of everything. So I use the same color for everything. So, and this is Thalo Blue, the green shade, by the way. But I use, this is a wash where it kind of broke down with water. And instead of doing lines or anything to show the transparency, I just stamped a couple hand carved stamps underneath. Um, this is a glaze and you can see how the color is so much more intense and even when you do a glaze as opposed to sort of watercolorish and spotty when you do a wash. This was the um, stain where I rubbed it in. I think if I had a gessoed surface, as opposed to a piece of paper, um, the stain would have worked out differently because if you're unfamiliar with gesso, then let's just go over it very quickly. So gesso is a bottom coat, a first layer. It is the thing that makes you use less paint overall because it's almost like it seals your surface and makes it less absorbent. And most commercial canvases that you buy, if you go to Michael's, or Hobby Lobby, or Dick Blick, or your local art supply shop, or whatever, most commercial canvases that you get are pre-gessoed for you, which may be why you've never had to like gesso a canvas to get it going. Um, so when I'm painting on paper, the paper is absorbing the paint. If I had been painting on top of gesso, it would have stayed wet a little longer, and so maybe rubbing it in would have been a slightly different effect. This is still very pretty, but I am aware that it's not the same effect I would get on that gessoed surface. And as a um, art history geekery moment, one of the um, things that the abstract expressionists started doing in art that blew people's minds is they either didn't gesso their canvases or they gessoed them unevenly on purpose so that they could use like paint, red paint across their canvas, except that some places it would absorb into the canvas fabric and some places it, there would be like a resist, right, where the white gesso behind it is also reflecting the light. Kind of interesting stuff, right? Anyway, and then the last thing was trying her veil. And what I found is I was using too much white paint and not enough medium. So this was, I thought in my first pass that I had it because I was like, okay, one third paint, two thirds matte medium. That'll be more than enough. Nope. So it's kind of added even more matte medium. It still wasn't enough. So then I added even more matte medium and I grabbed my art journal and I had a page that wasn't working for me. And so what I did is I put the whitewash or the veil over everything that wasn't this leaf, this tag, this piece of paper, and also this red piece of paper. Everything else got kind of a whitewash. And what I love is it really unified the whole background and softened it up and was a great look too. So um does gesso work for wood services yes yes it does so gesso is uh it depends I mean, it depends what you're doing gesso is an acrylic primer so if you're going to put acrylic onto your wood then absolutely on a wood panel or anything like that okay okay so welcome to everybody thanks for uh keeping checking in tell me where you're from i always appreciate that so we are going back in here. So there's a whole bunch of stuff where she's showing how to um, create different glazes and stuff like that. Uh, and this is when I figured out that the veil had to be white. Because here she's talking about adding a veil. And you can see, I hope you can see, that that is definitely that sort of whitish look. And there's nowhere else in the book I could find her talking about a veil that was any other color. Because I think when you start making it another color, then it's a glaze. So I think the terminology difference, uh, and I'm totally speaking for Jody, which I have obviously no right to do, but I think the terminology difference that I'm kind of pulling out of her book is that obviously washes add water, glazes add matte medium, um, stain is rub it in, but if you have white with a medium, then it's a veil. So it's like a, a glaze and a veil are like friends, except that glaze is any color and veil is white. Okay. 
So I hope that helps. Then she has so many great quotes, by the way, throughout the book that she's pulled from artists. And I really enjoyed reading all these great quotes and tips from other people. Um, hey, Jana, thanks so much for the super sticker. I really appreciate it. Uh, okay, so the next thing on here I just wanted to show you is this tip she put here, which is she said, as an artist, carefully consider how to pull the elements and principles together to make a painting more impactful. In the end, only you can decide what to include and what to leave out, which area to emphasize and what path you hope the viewer takes as they visually move throughout your work. So I teach a lot of design and principles in my design boot camp and in a lot of my classes and all that kind of stuff. And I think one of the things is people always want there to be like a way, a right way. And I think one of the things that's so important to understand, which Jody says here so clearly, is there is a right way for you and there is a right way for me. And there is a right way for the person next to you. And we don't all have to do things the right way. And we don't all have to think the same things are attractive. And, you know, you could look at this and be like, Julie, this is the single ugliest thing I've ever seen. And you should be humiliated that you're putting it out on the Internet. And somebody else could be like, Julie, I want to buy that for one million dollars. And somebody else could be like, it's not finished. It needs hot pink. And somebody else, could, you know what I mean? Everybody could have a million different opinions about the exact same thing. And all of them are right. I'm going to say that again. All of them are right because that's your opinion. Now, you don't have to write to me and tell me that you think it's ugly because I have feelings, but you can think that and be right. OK, and I think that the more you trust your convictions in terms of what you like, both seeing and creating, then I think that's so key to really finding out who you are. Right. And I can see that Melinda agrees with me that there is a right way for you. And that's the same with books. This book could be mind blowing and life changing for somebody. And then for somebody else be like, this is the worst book I've ever read. And if you look at Amazon reviews on any product, you will really find that to be true. Right. Everybody has an opinion. Ah, oh, thanks, Jay. If I had an extra million dollars, there are so many things that I would buy, too. You know what makes me crazy? There probably are some people who have an extra million dollars somewhere in the world. I'm sure that that's true. Okay, so let's keep going on through here. She's got lots of great advice on creating collage papers, on doing all kinds of stuff. I can see here that my camera is being a little bit funny. So let's see if I can't get it back in and looking a little bit better. Um, so I'm just going to stop my camera right there for a second on the overhead and see if I can't make that feed um, improve a little bit. Because I'm sorry, I hate it when the quality, particularly on the overhead camera, is kind of not the greatest. Okay, I think I fixed it, but there's only one way to find out. Let's see. Eh, still a little bit wonky. I'm sorry about that. I think my internet is being grumpy at me. Well, let's see if I remove my face for a second. Doesn't improve the feed. Okay, so technical issues, but let's keep on going. So um, one of the things that I also tried out of here. Oh, and look just how beautiful her work is. I hope that you can see this. Just so many, it's graphic and beautiful and sort of like soft colors. Really, really nice. So she has a section about putting your skills to work. And I skipped some of the landscape stuff because it, it wasn't my cup of tea. And I think that's important to know about yourself, obviously. But of course, um, exploring shapes and pattern was very interesting to me. And this is an exercise I tried called Simple Grid Form. So this is the piece that she created from this exercise. You can see it. She has your primaries here, yellow, red, and blue. And then this is the piece that I made inspired by this exercise. Okay, so here you go. You can see, and one of the things that was really interesting to me, because I think I talked about her muted colors just a moment ago, is that she starts with some black gesso on this one. And what I found doing it, starting with that black gesso, is that I found that it made the colors a little darker and murkier than I normally go for. You know, they were a little kind of more... Um, 
scooted back, pushed back, which was kind of interesting for me. So I've turned this one a couple different ways. I think it goes this way, but then at times I change my mind and it goes this way. I don't know. I kind of like this sort of mountain shape that's coming up from here. Um, so one of the things that she says in here is she says to draw grid guidelines. So for me, a grid goes top to bottom, right, and left to right. But then I noticed when I looked at the picture that her grid is not necessarily going all the way top to bottom, left to right, right? There are definitely places where it's sort of stopping short. So, and if I look at her final piece, I can see that, that her grid isn't necessarily, you know what I mean, all the way. There's places where the sections kind of combine. So I think it's good to use both the pictures and the written instructions here. But I had a really interesting, um, I had a really interesting time doing this. The thing that was kind of um, fun for me was I tried to read the instructions and not just do what I wanted. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because I have a way of painting. I have a way of engaging with an abstract. I have a way of doing it. So I tried to sort of follow in the order that she did. And then, you know, some of the instructions are much more general, like tie the sections together, you know, it, you know, and she gives some instructions for some ways you can do it. She says, dry brush a color from the top of your surface across the bottom edge of the piece to help tie both areas together visually. So that's actually how this blue ended up on here because I covered half of it, you know what I mean, with blue and all that kind of stuff. So it's an interesting way to work to kind of try to get somebody else's um, order of doing things in your head because I think so often we're on autopilot and I found that really refreshing and exciting. It was it was like taking a class, right? When you take a class, you're not making your art. This is the problem when people come to class is they think like, I'm going to leave class with the most amazing piece of art I've ever made and we're going to frame it and it's going to be fat. No, you're going to go to class and you're going to learn something. You're going to go to class and you're going to look inside somebody else's head. You're going to go to class and you're going to be stimulated. You're going to go to class and you're going to be challenged. You're going to go to class and you're going to be bored maybe even. But you're going to go to class and your job is simply to look for things you want to steal. And I don't mean steal like you don't give somebody credit. I mean steal like, oh, I love that idea of working in layers of glaze instead of opaque layers. I'm going to do that in my own way. You know what I mean? And so I think that it's really important to try out living in other people's brains. That's why taking classes, reading books, all that kinds of stuff is so important. Okay. Uh, and if you came in late, like Jim, this is Jody Ohl's Abstracts in Acrylic and Ink. And yes, 100% order matters. And so it may be that somebody else's order doesn't make sense to you in terms of the order that they do the steps. So sometimes you can take their techniques and just reorder them for your brain. All of our brains are wired differently. It's part of the magic of what makes us unique individuals. And I think that as long as you remember that there's nothing wrong with you if you think differently from somebody else, and there's nothing wrong with someone else if they think differently than you, we're all trying to get to the same place, which is art that we love. And you just have to figure out for yourself what is the process that really, really, really works for you. Oh, Sherry. 100%, you know, part of what makes classes so much fun really is the attitude. I love it when people come to class and I always ask at the beginning of class what people want to get out of it. And it always makes me happy when they say, I'm just here to have fun. I just want to learn something. I just want to do, because I feel like that, if you go in with low expectations, you're always going to come out with something great, right? Okay. So um, there's a lot more Duralar fun in here. There's a lot more, um, there's some like cityscape sort of more representational things. Here's the circle abstract she's doing where she's cutting the skin that she made earlier. There's some different experimenting that she's encouraging you to do. Some stencils come into play and stuff like that. There's a lot of playing with, I think she is a big fan of circles as am I, as are most people, abstract collage. And I love, like I said, there are so many quotes throughout this book that I think are fantastic. This was one of my favorites. Um, and it says, I shall become a master in this art only after a great deal of practice. And that is 100% true. I have to say, I had a meeting with one of my coaching clients yesterday. 
And she said something that was so true to me, which we were talking about her personal style. And she just said, I think I need to make a lot more art before I can even enter into that conversation. And I was like, you got it. 100% true. Absolutely. And this is such a good comment, Lee. And uh, Lee, I just called you by your last name, Kay. Uh, which is that uh, people be, are frustrated because their work doesn't look like someone else's work. And you know what? Your work should never look like somebody else's work. Your work should always look like you. I think people feel this way about their handwriting. I think people feel this way about their faces. I mean, I think people feel this way about a lot of things about themselves. And as in art, as in life, the more you can embrace who you are, the magic of who you are, the magic of the way you hold the brush, the magic of the way you put colors together, the magic of your eye, the more that you can see the things that come easy to you, not as stupid or less than because they come easy, but as your special gifts and talents, just the stronger of an artist you'll be, you know? I think that's so key. Okay. So lots of beautiful, exciting work throughout the book and good ideas for ways to work. Lots of ones now. Finishing options. This one was interesting to me. I almost always leave everything matte. That's just my personal choice. I like matte. But I decided to put a gloss finish on this. I don't know how much you're going to be able to see that gloss finish maybe reflecting in the light here. But I really like it. It makes the painting look more unified in a funny way. So I actually really like the gloss coat on this a lot. And I'm going to start doing some of that more. And so then that drove me to want to try this technique that she has here, where she takes a painting and she covers it with pouring medium. And then she drops some paint into the medium. So I'm going to hold this up a little closer so you can see it. Do you see how she has a finished painting? She covers it with pouring medium. Then she drops paint into the pouring medium and it kind of blooms. So these little dots become these big blooms. So I wanted to try this. So I had a wood canvas kicking around that I had done some stuff on that I didn't really like. It's a big fat one. Nice, deep, right? Wood canvas. So I did this quick grid painting on it and then I put the pouring medium on it. And I used white, which you can see that just like trailed and bloomed all over. And then I tried some thicker black paint, which I also didn't like. I kind of hate this right now. I'm not going to lie. I hate how I also used a little bit of blue, which you can see trailed into here. Um, and I just I did not like the way when this dried that this turned out. I thought it kind of ruined what had been under there. And I was kind of grumpy about it. But then I had my epiphany which I hope that you will have when you see this. So remember how I said earlier about the Duralar that I don't like when there's like a big um, chunk of shiny? Well, this is already super shiny. I mean, look at that reflective surface because it has the pouring medium on it. So this looks already like a glass surface. So then I thought, hey, what if you take the Duralar, put it on, put the pouring medium on top of it, and then you would lose the shininess of the Duralard. Do you know what I mean? So if I wanted to cut out a section of this, like these little dots, just like this. And again, this is Duralar for wet media so that I know that this wet media is going to dry on here and stay on here and all that stuff. I could take this little section Maybe that would go be fits better this way, I think. Put it on here. And even without adding more pouring medium on top, because this whole surface is shiny, that one shiny square doesn't stand out. Now, you're going to think I'm overreacting about the shininess thing, but I'll just show you. So how about in my sketchbook? Um, here's a painting. It's mostly uh, matte stuff, right? You can see that. If I try to get this to reflect, it's not reflecting, right? So now if I put the Duralar on top of it, it's cool that there's pattern, but you guys, there's a weird shiny square in the middle of my um, painting, right? So that's why I'm kind of in love with the idea here of, since this already has this shiny coat on it, 
I think this is a really neat way, A, to fix what I don't like about the way that all of this paint bloomed out. I'm not a fan of the blooming. Maybe I'm too much of a control freak. I don't want to think too deeply about that. But anyway, um, I think this will be a really cool way to sort of integrate some of these great skins and other like Duralar things that I've been doing for a long time. Hello. Um, into a new way. So if I would say, I feel like I took a lot away from the book, but if I take one thing away from the book, for me, it's got to be this idea of using a shiny top coat, using a shiny top coat. Sometimes it's the simplest of things. That's such a dumb, that's it. I mean, it's not dumb. It's obviously like good advice, but it's such a small thing maybe to take away from a whole book. And so I think that's great because I could probably read this book in five years and have a different reaction to it. I probably could have read it five years ago and had another different reaction to it because it really depends where you are and kind of the stuff that you're looking for, the current problems that you're dealing with, all that kind of stuff. So overall, I would say, you know, for me, definitely that idea of top coat, super important. I, I made a lot of art in the past like three or four days, just as I was working through the book. Um, I don't love all of it, but I love a lot of it. And so that was really fun and exciting. And, you know, I would say overall, I'm very happy with it. So the next book club, if you're interested, is on February 9th at 12.15 p.m. Eastern. We always meet on Wednesdays at 12.15. We will be discussing the book, Mark Harold's Workbook. This is another book that's been in my stash forever. Now, here's an interesting thing. Mark Harold is an artist who I love. He's English. He's a printmaker and a collage artist. Check out his beautiful stuff. This is not an instructional book. This is kind of like a sexy peek into his work life. And so it's just filled with tons and tons of pictures of his work and some writing about like his process and stuff. And so I'm really interested to talk next month because I'm sure you have books like this or are attracted to books like this, but don't know how to use them in order to make your own work. And so I'm really excited to talk about how like I was inspired by finally doing more than just taking a peek at the pictures, but reading the text and really looking through this guy. So I have the Amazon link there for you, but I think you can also get it from your library because it's a bit of a pricey book. It's like $45. Um, you can see it's giant hardcover book, which is probably why, and also it comes from England. Um, but I'm, I'm excited about that one. I think it'll be really good. Um, if you want to see more of what I have to offer, you can of course visit juliebalzer.com. You can subscribe to this YouTube channel. I also, um, if you hit the join button, you can become a part of Scan and Cut Club where I share a ton of Scan and Cut information. There are three tutorial videos every month, lots and lots of content. And of course, I offer tons of art classes. I'd love to see you in class over at balzerdesigns.com. You guys have been great. I appreciate your enthusiasm and everybody um, who's leaving comments and questions and all that kind of stuff. So thanks so much. And I'll hopefully see you next month. Tell all your friends to come. Bye.